I want to welcome everyone to our Great Lenten Lecture Series. Probably would have been good if I looked back and saw how many years we've been doing this. It must be about 15, I suppose, but I'll, I'll try to have that for you next week. I'm giving the lecture next week. This year, we're going to talk about virtues and vices. I mean, we kind of talk about those things all the time, but we're going to focus on that. And I think it's going to be a really good way to have uh, fruitful spiritual discussions. So today, Father Colin, who's uh, in charge, I would say, of our, our lecture work here, he makes sure that it happens um, and uh, often gives the majority of the lectures, which is good because it's very clear that people are tired of hearing from me, and that's fine. I don't blame you. Um, today, Father Colin will give the first lecture on uh, virtues and vices, and I will let him take it from there. Um, if we can have your attention during the the lecture, that will be great. We understand that people want to talk, uh, but you had all liturgy to talk, and you did. So uh, since since that's done, uh, hopefully now we're, we're ready to listen uh, to the, the lecture, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Father Paul. Okay, so this series, I mean, we've been doing the Lenten lecture series for quite some time, but it, it's been maybe, I want to say two or three years since we've been doing themes uh, for each of the, of the series. Before they were, when I first started coming here at least, they were fairly eclectic. Um, they were just kind of whatever the person wanted to talk about, of course, with, with uh, Father Gregory's blessing. Um, but it was, there wasn't really a cohesive theme. But we've gotten into a bit more of a, um, this is almost a sequel to the Nativity Lent. Because Nativity Lent, we talked about Orthodox Christian anthropology. So how, what we believe about mankind, what we believe about our role um, in the world and our relationship with God and so on and so forth. And this very much is a continuation of that in which we look at the ways that we are to both abide by that reality and the ways in which we can fall away. And it's very good that we do this, especially during Great Lent, because Great Lent should be a time of um, reflection, of great uh, self, self-reflection, self and of repentance, right? We need to know what it is we're repenting from. We need to be able to name those things that keep us from God, and we need to, knowing what they are, be able then to have a toolkit that allows us to fight them. So if we are able to do that, if we know how to fight them through the teaching of the church, then we'll be much better off, right? Because the church doesn't leave us uh, on our own in the spiritual life. It, 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 you know, Christ doesn't just say repent and then leave it at that. Uh, he tells us how, right? Both through his own words in the Gospels as well as through the uh, writings of the saints. So when we're beginning this series, uh, this today will mostly just be a definition of terms so that we can know what it is we are talking about. And the three predominant terms that we will be talking about are virtue, vice, and passion. These are all different things, of course, um, but the last two are very often uh, misconstrued. As well, as an aside, this is essentially a, an exploded version of one of our catechism classes. So if you have been neglecting catechism or haven't been going because you don't think you need it, once again, we will find you and, and you can't escape. We're coming to you with the catechism, but uh, this is an eight-week or well, six-week version of what would normally be a, a two- to three-hour class. So what is virtue? Then, mankind was created in the image and likeness of God and is called to communion with God, who is good and the source of all good. This is the chief aim of our lives. Our participation in the good things of God is known as virtue. Virtue is the assimilation of the attributes of God through abiding in the commandments of God. Or, in short, virtue is what it means to be like God. When God created man, he said, let us make man in our image and likeness, right? The image of, of God is those that rational faculty, the capability for us to choose love, to choose to follow God. And then the likeness is something we grow into. So virtue, then, is the state in which mankind was created, as well as a calling for man to continue to grow in. There is no point in which we can just stop, right? We can say, okay, we're done. That's it. We've made it. Uh, you know, God is, God is infinite. He is without beginning or end, and thus the calling to be like God is a goal we will be striving for for all of eternity. God alluded to this when he showed his back to Moses in the book of Exodus. We cannot be like God if we stand opposed to him, meaning we see his face, as Moses asked. We can only abide in virtue if we follow him, if we continue to 
follow after God, which is why he would not show Moses his face. Virtue is itself also not worthy of a reward. Rather, it is what is expected of us according to nature. It is, in short, the bare minimum. It is what is expected of us. It is what we need to do in order to abide in communion with God, which is our calling. St. Mark the Ascetic, talking about this, says, Do you see how every virtue that is performed, even to the point of death, is nothing other than refraining from sin? Now to refrain from sin is a work within our own natural powers, but not something that buys us the kingdom. While men can scarcely keep what belongs to him by nature, Christ gives the grace of sonship through the cross. And in a most perfect way of explaining this, our Lord himself says in the Gospel of Luke, according to Luke, <clears throat> When you have done all that is commanded you, say, we are useless servants. We have only done what is our duty. So virtue is a duty. It is not something above and beyond what we're supposed to do. It is not something that we should be puffed up about. We should not feel proud, for example, when we give alms or when we uh, do something nice for our wife or our husband or when we uh, you know, clean up after ourselves or whatever. This is simply what is expected of us. It is what is necessary. You know, we, we, don't, we shouldn't expect some sort of grand reward by doing simply what is expected, right? St. John of Damascus, also commenting on virtue, says that virtue can only be attained through unremitting effort. Virtue is so-called because it is something we choose. We choose it and will it in the sense that we do good by deliberate choice and of our own free will, not unintentionally and under compulsion. So virtue is something that we have to actively participate in. We have to will and desire and make it happen. And it's also not just the things we do, but how it is done, right? Because the good is only good, as St. John says in this uh, treatise, which is in volume two of the Philokalia, if it is done in a good way, right? So if we do good work, expecting something in return, expecting a reward, or expecting to be noticed by other people, or for any other reason, other than out of love for Christ, then that good deed is not good, right? And then it's not truly virtue. The Lord doesn't simply look at what it is we do or the outward actions, but he also looks at our hearts. A fairly uh, good indicator of this is the Sermon on the Mount, in which the Lord gives this, this very uh, deep and intimate understanding of the commandments of God, being something that penetrates all the way to our innermost inclinations, not just our external actions. So it matters not just what we do, but how we do it, and under what context, and so on. So that is what virtue is. Virtue is the uh, is that which is good, that which is according to the will of God, that which keeps us in, and allows us to remain in communion with God. So vice, then, is the absence of that. Wisdom of Sirach uh, says the following, For God created man to be immortal and made him to be an image of his own eternity. Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world, and they that do hold of his side do find it. As we read, uh, it was Friday, I believe, in Genesis, we read about the fall of man, right? In which man was created in the garden, he was created uh, very good, as the Lord said, and called to abide in his commandments, but that did not obviously uh, be the final result. It wasn't just God created Adam and everything was good and everyone was happy. If we take any kind of moment to self-reflect, we recognize that within ourselves there are things that keep us from God. And this is because of the fall, right? Adam and Eve fell from God. They failed to fulfill that commandment, and they broke away. And through that, they lost that which they had. They lost life, right? So uh, so we've begun to establish then that virtue, that the opposite of virtue, rather, is touching on death and sin. The opposite of virtue is vice, or to be more accurate, it is the absence of virtue, because it is not itself a substantive thing, right? There, it's not like uh, the kind of notion that you have in today's society where good and evil are at war with each other, and they're both equally powerful forces or something like that. No, evil is simply the absence of good. It is the deprivation of that which is, which is right? God is the one who is, as he says in Exodus, I am that I am. And all that is against God is lacking of substance, is lacking of any sort of um, reality, right? So St. Gregory of Nyssa explains this really well in his catechetical discourse. He says, The genesis of evil had no way in its beginning from the divine will, for vice would be blameless, or would be without, for vice would be without blame, rather, if God was claimed to be its maker and father. But the evil is somehow implanted within, being composed by decision, then, 
when, where there is any withdrawal of the soul from the good. For just as sight is an activity of nature and blindness is a privation of natural activity, so too virtue is opposed to vice. For the genesis of vice is to be understood in no other way than as an absence of virtue. For just as when the light is taken away, darkness follows. But when light is present, darkness does not exist. So as long as good is present in a nature, vice is in itself something non-existent. But the withdrawal of what is superior is the genesis of the opposite, right? So he likens it to turning on a light in a dark room. The darkness doesn't fight back. The darkness doesn't abide. It vanishes because darkness is simply an absence of light. So too, vice is simply an absence of virtue. It is a deprivation of good things. So it can only be understood in a negative term. So vice is, in short, the distortion of virtue into that which is contrary to nature. Love becomes, for example, lust. Watchfulness becomes listlessness. Humility becomes pride, and so on. The vices can only be understood in relation to their uh, counterparts, their virtuous counterparts, whereas virtue does not need the vice in order for it to be understood. So how do we fall into vice, then? How does this happen? Well, first, it can happen with deception, right? The devil tempted Adam and Eve, and they fell. But ultimately, for us, it happens for three primary reasons, and those are also outlined according to St. Mark the Ascetic, whose name we celebrated on Monday. Once again, happy name is Mark. Uh, he says, imagine that there are three powerful and mighty giants of the Philistines, upon whom depends the whole hostile army of the demonic Holofernes. When these three have been overthrown and slain, all the power of the demons is fatally weakened. These three giants are the vices already mentioned. Ignorance, the source of all evils. Forgetfulness, its close relation and helper. And laziness, which weaves the dark shroud enveloping the soul in murk. So these three things are the reasons that we fall into sin. Forgetfulness, laziness, and... Forgive me. And ignorance, right? So I saw it right there, and then it just went away. This it's, it's the first week of Lent. It's been, it's been a lot, so uh, I just, it went away. So what are the names, then, of these vices? We know, we very often know what the virtues are, but what are the vices? St. John of Damascus talks about this. He says, you should also learn to distinguish the impassioned thoughts that promote every sin. The thoughts that encompass all evils are eight in number. Those of gluttony, unchastity, avarice, anger, dejection, listlessness, self-esteem, and pride. It does not lie within our power to decide whether or not these eight thoughts are going to arise and disturb us. But to dwell on them or not to dwell on them, to excite the passions or not to excite them, does lie within our power. So this list is the list which we are going to focus on during this Lent. These eight vices that uh, so often try and pull our soul away, so often try to ensnare us and enslave us. Uh, these are the primary sources upon which all of their sins flow, right? We could, for example, go over the names of every sin. Uh, there's a really good book in the Philokalia by St. Peter of Damascus. Um, it is the Fount of Divine Knowledge, and in it he names every sin that's listed in the scriptures, right? It's something like 240, 250. That, that's a little too expansive for us to go over a six-week period. So we're going to stick with the eight, right? There is this very simple uh, eight list that we can go with. So, then knowing what, a vir what, knowing what a virtue is and knowing what a vice is, then we have to go to passion. Because we hear passion a lot through the, the services of the church, in a lot of the writings of the saints, in a lot of homilies. Very often in our day and age, passion and vice are, mis are kind of looked at as synonymous, right? But that's not accurate, and that's not true. Because there are certain vices in which one might not struggle with, right? But there are certain vices in which we do struggle with or we are ensnared to, or find ourselves habitually doing, and that is what a passion is, right? So sin, for example, is a momentary failing or a lapse from virtue into vice, but it is something that is not uh, taken hold of our souls, right? It's something that we can fall from, but we can also repent. A passion, however, results from habitual sin. It is through habitual sin that we give up our free will and passively engage in sin. So eventually the, the sin just kind of runs roughshod over us, right? It's, it's like we're not even acting upon ourselves. St. Paul talks about this in Romans. He says, what I wish to do, I do not do, and what I do, I do not want to do. You know, so he, he kind of laments this reality of the passions taking hold of one's soul. So our will is no longer than a part of the equation. Sin acts of its own accord within the passion of man. St. Peter of Damascus explains this as follows. 
He says, when the soul dallies for a long time with an impassioned thought, there arises what we call a passion. This, in its turn, through its intercourse with the soul, becomes a settled disposition within us, compelling the soul to move of its own accord towards the corresponding action. Where passion is concerned, unquestionably and invariably, we must either repent proportionally or else undergo punishment in the age to come, as St. John Climaco states. We are punished for the lack of repentance, and not because we have to struggle against temptation. Otherwise, most of us could not receive forgiveness until we had attained total dispassion. But as St. John Climacos again observes, it is not possible for all to achieve his passion, yet all can be saved and reconciled with God. So this is a very important thing to note. What is important in the spiritual life is not that we get rid of our sins, right? Very often uh, when people come to confession, they'll say something along the lines of, I want to, this thing gone. It won't go away. I can't get rid of it. I want it gone. I want it out of here. But very often that's simply not what's going to happen, right? The Lord gives us uh, these sins to struggle with, oftentimes all of our lives. It's very rare for us to be entirely freed of any sort of temptation. Also, it's important to note that, that the fact that we are tempted is not a, a moral failing of our own, right? As St. Peter of Damascus said earlier, or St. John of the, sorry, St. John of Damascus said earlier, uh, these passions come our way, right? They are presented to us, and we have a choice. We can either go with them or reject them, right? We can either accept the temptation or we can reject the temptation. And we need to identify the fact that the temptation is not our moral failing. It's how we handle the temptation. That's a very important thing to discuss when we're talking about what is sin and what is not sin, right? Just because we're being tempted does not mean we're falling. We can choose. We can choose to reject the temptation. We can choose to endure it with patience. Uh, we can choose to not give into it and not let our free will be violated through acting upon that sin. St. Nectarios then, further expounding on this, states that our free will is only free when it moves towards the good. That is the will of God. To enter into sin is to enslave our will to death, thus restricting our ability to will of our own accord. In his work on Concern for the Soul, which is a really wonderful text, uh, it's available on Amazon. It, I think it's only available on Amazon, actually. Um, but a lot of St. Nectarios' works are currently being translated in English, and they're using that as a publishing house, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, he says, The freedom of man then is certainly limited wherever, whenever it falls away from the divine law and wars against the will of God. Because in revolting against the divine law, the eternal divine will, it finds itself confined in, in the confined and finite cycle of the finite will of the will of the flesh, of the aesthetic nature, which is servile and finite, and it truly loses the mark of freedom itself, because the spiritual and intellectual nature and the will thereof are subject unto the aesthetic nature and to its will. So when we sin, we enslave ourselves to that demon that desires to get us to fall. But when we cease to sin, we abide in free will. Our will is not violated, right? We are able to abide in the commandments of Christ, because God <coughs> is not command. he's not forcing us to do good. He's, he never forces or violates our will in that way. God desires for us to love him, as we talked about in the Nativity Lent, uh, with, with uh, human anthropology, right, with our free will. God desires for us to abide in his commandments, but at no point does he force us or enslave us to this. He gives us a choice to either abide or not, right? But the demons, on the other hand, seek to entice us away from the will of God, and then once entice us, force themselves upon our will, and make us do things that very often we are terrified of, we are disgusted by, and fill us with shame, with regret, with misery. That's not the reality when it comes to following the will of God, right? This is something completely done of our own free will, completely done of our own volition, and as such, it leaves our conscience pure. It leaves our conscience clean, and you can see that from its fruit. So, Knowing all of this and, and seeing uh, within ourselves very often, especially as we went through the first week of Lent and having the great canon and, and being able to reflect on our own disposition and seeing those things that are within our souls, uh, it's fairly obvious, at least from my perspective, that the passions are strong, at least within myself. I, I hope not to uh, project too much on all of you, but I suspect the same is true if we are honest with ourselves there are certain vices that we struggle with more than others, whether that be gluttony or unchastity or avarice or the rest, right? There is something within our souls that entangles us. So what do we do about it? How do we handle that? Is there just no hope? Do we give up? Do we just say whatever, this, this is the way it is? 
Or, you know, do we say there's no hope for me until I, I'm free of this, until the thing never goes away, right? Once again, we need to look to the saints for their guidance. St. Peter of Damascus provides for us a most sublime and edifying work on how to live even if we are ensnared to passion. He says that even, when, even if you are not what you should be, you should not despair. It is bad enough that you have sinned. Why, in addition, do you wrong God by regarding him in your ignorance as powerless? Is he who, for your sake, created the great universe that you beheld, incapable of saving your soul? And if you say that this fact, as well as his incarnation, only makes your condemnation worse, then repent, and he will receive your repentance, as he accepted that of the prodigal son and the prostitute. But if repentance is too much for you, and you sin out of habit, even when you do not want to, show humility like the publican. This is enough to ensure your salvation. For he who sins without repenting, yet does not despair, must of necessity regard himself as the lowest of creatures, and will not dare to judge or censor anyone. Rather, he will marvel at God's compassion, and will be full of gratitude towards his benefactor. And so many receive, and so many may receive many other blessings as well. Even if he is subject to the devil and that he sins, yet from fear of God he disobeys the enemy when the latter tries to make him despair. Because of this, he has, pro he has his portion with God. For he is grateful, gives thanks, is patient, fears God, does not judge, so that he may not be judged. All these are critical qualities. If those attacked by many passions of soul and body endure patiently, do not, out of negligence, surrender their free will, and do not despair, they are saved. So in short, without patient endurance, we cannot be saved. We must endure those temptations within our hearts, patiently looking to Christ, who knows the inclinations of our hearts, and has voluntarily submitted to the cross for our sakes, right? This is the best way to endure these temptations. When we have these inclinations in our soul, we look to the cross, right? That's why we have crosses everywhere in the church. This is why we all wear crosses on our chest. Christ knows what we have done. He knows what we are being tempted with. He knows those inclinations of our soul. And what has he done about it? He has taken them upon himself. He has destroyed them by his own abiding, by his taking them upon himself. He who, is, who cannot be passionate took our passions upon himself and destroyed them, which is what we say when you say that Christ destroyed death by death. This, then, is the way of life, to patiently endure temptation while clinging to the saving work of Christ through the life of the church. The way of death, then, is as follows. It is dejection, giving up on our struggle, and entering into slavery of sin without resistance. Now, as we go through the following weeks, we will identify what those passions are, and we will talk about how to fight them directly, how to deal with those inclinations that are within our souls. And hopefully, as we go through this, uh, we will spend some time thinking about ourselves, right? Saying, well, how does this impact me? If we listen to one of these talks and we say, wow, my spouse really can, can work on this, right? My spouse really can deal with their gluttony or their unchastity or whatever. Um, we will make it through the entirety of Lent thinking about how somebody else should repent and we ourselves will not repent, right? And, and then it'll do nobody any good because ultimately what that will do is it'll bring us into the vice of judging and we will have failed to repent ourselves. Our spouse will probably recognize that we're judging them and they might even be thinking the same things. Like, wow, this person can really deal with this. And in so doing, we just we just waste the fast, right? We, we waste this opportunity that's before us. So, you know, the homework that we have here is to think about these, these lessons with ourselves, to look at ourselves, to say, do I struggle with this thing? How do I struggle with this thing? And how can I apply what's being spoken of in these lectures to myself in this fast and past the fast so that I can uh, properly meet the Lord in his resurrection? Are there any questions or comments or concerns? Thank you. John. Um, you quoted, Father, um, I think it was Peter of Damascus, if I did not make your uh, repent proportionally. What does that mean? What that means is that there are certain sins that bear a certain degree of weight in our soul, and we have to be able to lift that weight. Sometimes the weight is harder than others. I think St. Mary of Egypt is a good example of that and why uh, her life is read in the, in the in the Lenten fast, right? Because she struggled with, uh, well, she didn't even struggle. She was ensnared by carnal pleasure out of her own free will for 17 years. And so how long did she struggle? Does anybody know? This is a pop quiz. 17, 17 years. So she struggled for the same degree of time that she was ensnared to the passion. And since she was completely ensnared by carnality, 
she completely cut off any sort of carnal pleasure, right? So she shows us an icon, an extreme example, granted, but an icon of what is necessary in order to fight back against this thing with equal force that has ensnared us. Does that make sense? No. Kind of, sort of, yeah. So, they, you know, it's, it's kind of like certain sicknesses require light medicine, certain sicknesses require a bit stronger medicine. Follow up. So that proportionality, is that something that the, the individual sinner um, figures out and undertakes, or is it uh, uh, with the uh, help of the spiritual uh, father? So I'll repeat the question because I'm sure that I didn't catch it. Uh, catch it. He said, "Is that proportionality something that the sinner decides, or is something that he works with the spiritual father?" It's uh, a bit of both. Usually, it's you know, for certain sins, it's the same thing with certain sicknesses. We we can take care of them on our own. We can we don't need to go to the doctor, right? If I have if I have a cold with a fever, I pop a Dayquil and I move on, right? So certain smaller sins that we are aware of. And we and have a very clear solution to, we can take care of those on our own. With heavier sins, we need to go to the doctor, right? Same with sicknesses. There are certain illnesses where we say, I don't know what's wrong. I don't know why this is happening, so I'm going to go to the doctor to get this worked out. So it's the same thing, right? There, there are certain sins where it's very obvious what I need to do. If I'm overeating, what do I do in response? Fast, right? That's pretty simple. But with certain ones like, like pride or like self-esteem, or something like that, it's much more difficult for us to know how to get out of that. So it, it's, you know, it's taken, um, how do I say this? You, you take it a case by case basis, right? Um, we should still, of course, uh, discuss these smaller sins with our spiritual father in confession, right? We shouldn't just say, well, I'm going to deal with it and not mention it. We should, of course, confess, because confession is the beginning of repentance. Um, but very often in those cases, we, uh, you know, the priest will recognize, I don't need to give per this person advice on this because they're already dealing with it. Um, they, they already know the path forward. Um, so, yeah. 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 So, it might be a little bit uh, harder to answer. I am parent, well, pretty much three times now. But uh, living in America, like, and, you know, certain people push agenda of how they grew up, right? Like, reciprocity, right? Is it really bad? But as you said, um, you have to learn to give, right? Without looking for, you know, you scratch, I scratch your back, you scratch my back, and you know, kind of. And there's other like um, stuff like self-esteem. It's so good, right? Everybody promotes it. You gotta have self-esteem, you know, be proud of your kids, right? Like all of this kind of stuff, it just seems so contradicting to, as a you know Orthodox Christian and you know following Christ. Like anybody can have any kind of um, help. Like I've had to deal with it third time, and I'm struggling. Right. Well, yeah, I mean that's that's something that Saint Paul talked about in the in the church. This what this isn't a new issue, right? This isn't an American problem. This, this is, you know, if the Saint, if, if Saint Paul talked about it in the, in the scriptures, they didn't say things just because they felt like it. You know, he didn't say, be not conformed to the world and the lust thereof, but rather renew your mind through the partaking of Christ. He didn't say that just for fun, knowing the Americans will need this in 2,000 years, right? This, he said it because that was an issue even then. Even then, the people were living, the world was living in a way that was contrary to Christ, right? And, and so he would, and so even at that time, they had to do something about it, which was cling, cling to the church, right? And, you know, the world is going to tell you things. Fine. Let the world say what it's going to say, but abide in the teachings of Christ. If it if it matches up with the teachings of Christ, great. But if it doesn't, don't follow it, right? And that's going to have consequences, sure. People are going to look at you like you're funny, uh, maybe, and, and they might even object to you trying to do good things. I mean, this is kind of like what Father Gregory was talking about in the sermon, where there was a time in which it was easier uh, to, you know, there was a time in which society was more aligned with, with Christianity, right? And so it was easier at that to uh, abide in the commandments. But now it's a little more difficult, you know? And, and in the time of, of St. Paul and the time of the apostles, it was even more difficult because um, they were completely pagan. Now we're just kind of pagan. We're like a, a, a synthesized uh, Christian pagan culture right now. We're kind of uh, in between, but at that time it was entirely pagan. So 
Yeah, right? it's you know we look to the scriptures, we look to the saints, we seek their guidance. When there are good things in the world, we we praise it. When there are bad things, we reject it. And that's it. It's hard, it makes hard because I grew up like that too. Yeah, it is hard. It wasn't like you know. And again, and, you know, so yeah, so just to burst anyone's bubble, nothing that we're going to talk about is easy. <laughs> like, none of this is easy. It's simple. It's simple. And very often people want simple things to be easy, right? But it's not. Like, very simply, we could just say, stop it. Just stop sinning, right? That's a very simple thing, because that's what we're supposed to do. We're just supposed to work. But, you know, this isn't Bob Newhart. We can't do that. We have to actually say, this is how you do it. We need that clear instruction. We need that clear guidance. So yeah, of course, just stop it. But we're going to talk about how to do that. And that's not hard. Or that's not, that's not easy. It's simple, but it's hard. It's hard work. This is why the Lord says that wide is the gate. Um, and, and wide is the road that leads to destruction, and many find it. But narrow is the gate, and narrow is the road of salvation, and few find it. Right? So salvation is not something that's attained by everyone or by many. It's attained by the few who do the hard work. Does that make sense? So we do hard work. Anybody else? Any other questions? Or comments or concerns? Going once. John. I just, um, speaking of Philokali, and maybe this is more about the very brief, just uh, my question is about a, uh, a title in the library that I uh, came across, No Protodubia, which is also a, uh, you know, it's a talc of, of Philokali, but it doesn't line up. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like it's a different work, but why would it have the same name? It's got different uh, uh, authors and, and, and uh, Collection is, is different. What's is that the Russian philokalia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The little but Russian. It's also school sometimes like well, patristic, um, mm -hmm. not just patristic. No, patristic. Right. Well, the philokalia is is not so much a single text as much as it is a theme. And this this was something. I mean, book printing is traditionally was expensive. It's now much cheaper to do. But it was very common for people to collect works. And publish them, right? So, so we talk about the philokalia, in the sense that the most popular and prominent philokalia is Saint Nicodemus's and Saint Mark of Ephesus, or Saint Mark, uh, what was the other? whichever the Saint Mark is. Uh, I can't think of his name. It's not Saint Mark of Ephesus. Corinth, Saint Mark of Corinth, right? So, so theirs is the most popular collection of patristic texts, and that's kind of the gold standard. But it's kind of like the law of God, right? There are multiple different law of gods written by multiple different people. The theme is the same, but the content may be slightly different. It's not contradictory. Um, but yeah, the, the one that's the most popular is that one by, by St. Uh, Nicodemus. And then there in Russia, there was what's called the Little Russian Philokalia, which is you know a, a different set of, of collections. There are more modern ones, because there's a cutoff point, naturally, for St. Nicodemus's. Uh, which is, you know, about 14th, 15th century when he was alive. He lived in the 16th century or 17th. Um, so th there's a cutoff, right? And so that, that kind of tradition of, of compiling these spiritual texts continued after him. Um, but those ones are, are less popular, I guess, in, in terms of, of less well-known. So the capital P, typically you're talking about, that's the one published by Faber in four volumes? Yeah, but it is five volumes. And the fifth volume was translated, and if you're willing to endure a different publicator or publication, and so it looks different than the other four, which is kind of infuriating, but it's it's well worth it. So there are five volumes of the Philokalia as it was published by St. Nicodemus. Um, the, the four volumes were translated by Metropolitan Callistus and Mother Mary. Uh, Mother Mary died before Metropolitan Callistus, and so he took a pause on his work and was hoping to continue it at some point, and then he himself died, so he was not able to finish. And then a nun from Jerusalem, uh, Mother Christina, she took up the work herself and, and finished the fifth translation. So hers is available also on Amazon. Same uh, same woman who translated the works of St. Nectarios, she's just using Amazon as, as her uh, publishing house because they will, they will publish whatever you send them, which is really cool. But, uh, yeah. Um. So in the beginning of your lecture, you said something about uh, forgetting. It's not good. You forgot. Yeah. Did you you forgot what I said and how forgetfulness is bad? Yeah. So you know, like to to be able to forgive, or at least you know, 
Yeah, that's important. So uh, there, that's a kind of different sort of forgetfulness, right? That's a willful forgetfulness. Um, that's not out of negligence, right? This is kind of like what it says in, in the Psalms, right? As far as the east is from the west, so let the Lord remove our iniquities from us, right? So, so uh, he is willingly forgetting our sins. He's willingly forgetting these things out of his desire for the salvation of our souls. Um, however, you know, when we, when we are forgetful out of negligence or laziness, we forget the commandments of God and then fall into sin. This is an entirely different uh, kind of thing, right? There is a good, and, and this is also, this is just in line with, with what virtues are. Right? There is there is a good forgetfulness, and then there's a distortion of it, right? And the good forgetfulness is the forgetting of sins uh, in order to forget. But a bad forgetfulness is forgetting what is sin or not, forgetting the commandment of God and falling into sin. Uh, they are all from volumes one through three of the Philokalia. So St. John of uh, Damascus, he's volume three. His, his work is actually the bulk of volume three. Um, really, really good book. It's called The Fount of Divine Knowledge. Um, I also quoted St. Mark, of, uh, Mark St. Mark the Ascetic uh, from the volume one of the Philokalia. His, uh, he has two works in there, which is on those who think they're saved by works which I quoted, and also his letter to Nilos the, the ascetic, which I also quoted. Um, I also quoted St. John of Damascus, who is in volume two of the Philokalia, and his is, is called, his is a title called On Virtue and Vice, uh, which is a homily that he gave, and I think that's it. I think that is everyone I quote. And then St. Nectarius of Agni. Uh, and St. John Climacus, but that was a quote actually within a quote, so yeah. St. Peter of St. Okay. Peter of Damascus is found through divine knowledge. Saint uh, Saint Nicodemus called it the Philokalia in the Philokalia. It's like a summary of the entire Philokalia. So if you want to know what it's about, read that book. It's really good. It's long. It's, I, I started reading it kind of on a whim that one at one point. It took me like a year and a half. I was like, man, this is this is still going. I'm still not done. Um, I think I, yeah, I started it like maybe last Nativity Lent of twenty. 21, and I've just been slowly chipping away at it because I thought it was just never. Anyways, it's it's good. It's really good, but it's a lot. Um, yeah. Any other questions, or are we just going to start putting all the chairs away and leaving? All right. All right. Let's thank Father Colin for the great lecture. All right, next week we'll continue with the sort of low light of me, and then we'll just get better again.